Over the past several years, a dialogue between science and Buddhism has been going on, attracting quite a number of eminent scientists, psychiatrists, neurologists, biologists, and physicists. All parties who have joined the encounter were open-minded yet critical but eager to broaden their horizons by learning from each other's insights and methods of inquiry. The main difference between science and Buddhism is the purposes in the search for knowledge. In Buddhism, knowledge is acquired to free ourselves from suffering. While the insights of science can help us see things better, Buddhism can enlighten the path we should take so that suffering may cease. These series of lectures are meant to help us appreciate how science and Buddhism fit into the larger body to take into account the important role of wisdom and compassion in the search for knowledge. Perhaps Buddhism can resolve that seeming contradiction between objective reality, what's out there, and recent discoveries in modern physics that refute that objective reality. But before we begin, let us first clarify the pursuit of science and then explore whether Buddhism can complement it in the most important aim which is the cessation of suffering. My task now is to provide you with a brief background of Western cosmology from Ptolemy to Albert Einstein. Since primitive times, human beings have always been fascinated by the universe in which they lived. The pageant of the planets, the swarm of stars, the rising and setting of the sun, the waxing and waning of the moon, the cycle of the seasons. These were observable phenomena that intrigued our ancestors. Primitive humans had primitive ideas about the world. The sky was a great dome and the earth was the back of a giant turtle floating in the vast ocean of space. Legends, myths, religions sprung from celestial phenomena. As civilizations advanced, more rational explanations were introduced. An Egyptian living in Alexandria, Claudius Ptolemy, organized and systematized these explanations in the Almagest, a cosmology that placed the earth at the center of the universe with the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars around it. Ptolemy drew up an inventory of the universe and our place in it. And for the next 1,400 years, nobody challenged the soundness of his view. Immediate evidence showed the earth was inert while the heavens moved. Our earth formed the center of the universe and we were special because we were in it. Appearance was reality. Plants and animals were placed entirely at our disposal. The myriad concentric spheres encircling the earth were made for us. Heaven and earth were in perfect order 
and everything occupied a meaningful place in the general order of creation. It was a cosmology that gave us a sense of security and it fed our ego. The man who shook this solid foundation was Nicolaus Copernicus. In 1543, he published the Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, which showed that the system of Ptolemy was untenable. The Earth moved along with the other planets. It revolved around the Sun. It is not easy to mention the name of Copernicus without relating it to a turning point in worldview. Not only because the name is linked with a sea change unprecedented in the history of science or natural philosophy as it was then called, the shift in view from geocentric to heliocentric but also because everything, including our everyday knowledge and thinking, from 1542 henceforth has been deeply affected by the Copernican Revolution. A revolution that meant more than just an astronomical fact. We were no longer at the center of creation. We were not special. Instead, we were a superfluous byproduct, an accident lying in some remote corner of an absurd universe. In 1616, the book was banned by the Holy Congregation of the Index, the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, and thus its effects were not immediate until Galileo appeared on the scene that the idea got through the public at large, undermining the very foundations of religion, philosophy, and society. Before Galileo, it was believed that all you needed to learn could be ascertained through speculative thinking. But the telescope was invented and Galileo, although not the original inventor of the telescope, pointed it towards the moon and the planets and confirmed that Copernicus was correct. Galileo was the first man to investigate the loss of falling bodies, his great achievement being that he resorted to direct investigation of nature, thus earning for him the distinction of being called the father of experimental science. Meanwhile, a sense of meaninglessness and disconnection flowed from the new cosmology. What was a human being but an accident? Thinkers like René Descartes, well, turned inward and abandoned external observation of nature. The Cartesian cogito ergo sum became the basis for the modus existendi. Nowadays, we are no longer appreciative of the profound transformation caused by the Copernican Revolution because since childhood we have been oriented in the heliocentric worldview. It is hard for us to realize the confusion and uncertainty the new philosophy had wrought. The hierarchical order of society would be questioned. A sense of helplessness prevailed in a world thrown out of focus. But as science made fresh advances toward more knowledge, human beings began to ask themselves whether or not a new view of the world was possible. The great unifier who combined the discoveries of Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo into one 
magnificent system was Sir Isaac Newton. And Newton is the giant of the 17th century and probably of the entire history of science because his intellectual achievement cannot be overestimated. His deep insight into the nature of things was accompanied by his great caution in scientific investigation. His loss of motion and gravitation, his achievements in optics and the calculus, combined with the achievements of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, established a scientific explanation of natural phenomena, a cosmic order governed by natural laws. In the 20th century, giant telescopes had replaced primitive ones and opened up new vistas and new problems in our quest for a coherent picture of the world. Into this scene enters Albert Einstein. What exactly were the problems that Einstein was trying to solve? two problems. The first was the wave theory of light. Physicists had tried to measure the speed of the earth in absolute space, but every attempt resulted in a measurement of zero. Furthermore, every measurement of the speed of light in a vacuum resulted in a constant, that means the same, a result exhibited by no other form of nature. It was bizarre. The second problem was, what does it mean to say that two events, one near and the other at a distance from an observer, occur simultaneously? The event that occurs at a distance must take place earlier because it takes time for the light signal from the event to reach the observer. Einstein solved both problems in the special theory of relativity. The special theory of relativity rests on two principles. The first is the principle of the relativity of motion. Two observers traveling at uniform speed and subject to uniform forces. The laws of physics will be the same. The second principle is the axiom that the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant for all observers regardless of their motion. Take these two principles together and you have the special theory of relativity, which includes a new view of space and time as relationships, not things as earlier decreed by Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs>